Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is our uh, best practices in email marketing webinar. Uh, we're hosted by Faye Business Systems Group and uh, Acton. Um, a presentation. It's going to give you lots to think about as you move forward with your email campaigns, and hopefully, it's going to generate a lot of uh, cool new ideas that you can start putting to use uh, right away. Um, just so everyone is aware, we're going to re be recording the webinar today, and we'll be sure to send it over to you so you'll be able to share that with your team and uh, review it. And then uh, throughout the presentation, uh, please feel free to type in any questions at any time. We'll try to get to them uh, as soon as we can as they come in. And uh, for some reason, you know, we don't get to yours. Uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the webinar uh, is over. So just so you are aware who you are listening to, my name is Jesse Heller. I'm the Marketing Director at Fade Business Systems Group. We are an Acton Consulting Partner, and presenting alongside with me today is Mr. Brandon Contreras. He's the uh, Global Channel Manager of Development at Acton. Hey, Brandon, how are you doing today? Jesse, very well. Once again, as always, a pleasure to be presenting side-by-side -side with you and Fade Business Systems Group. Likewise, and everybody, if you could please minimize your March Madness brackets. I promise uh, it's only the first game or two. There's plenty of games left today, and uh, you'll be able to revisit those shortly. So uh, let's take a look at the agenda. Uh, today, five email tactics we're going to be focusing on. Uh, we're going to talk about some behavior-triggered emails and drip campaigns, which is uh, lead nurturing. Uh, some strategies around embedded media and uh, some interactivity with that. We'll discuss responsive design and uh, some hyper-targeting and dynamic content. And if you're not aware what any of this is, don't worry, you will be by the time we are through today. So the master email marketer, Brandon Contreras, I'm going to pass you the presenter rights. And Brandon, you got the floor. You'll take us through the presentation. Perfect. Outstanding. And again, these five tactics that we're going to cover in the next, uh, I don't know, roughly 55 minutes or so, um, again, at, to Jesse's point, certainly a lot for you to begin thinking about um, and, uh, you know, something you could simply walk away from this, you know, tactics that you can begin implementing. Right. Um, obviously, depending on your email service provider, depending on what's going on inside of your uh, organization, obviously, Faye and, and, and Acton are eager and anxious to assist you with these. But our effort today is simply to provide education around um, these specific tactics uh, in, in, in email marketing. Um, and uh, sorry about that. How about that? Um, these particular five tactics, we're going to dive into them. Um, the close of this, you'll have a couple of diamonds and gems that you can uh, immediately go back and, and begin working on, begin strategizing, begin using. Um, Jesse, just by way of logistics, because you know it's just kind of a slip and slide here for me, are you seeing those five topics there on your screen? Yes, sir. We see them. Perfect. Away we go. First and foremost, Behavioral triggered emails. So now, again, the smiles, the smirks in the audience that I'm already seeing, this may be something that you are already implementing. Individuals take action on specific content. Individuals take action inside of an email that you send them. Individuals download things. Individuals perform some sort of behavior. Then they are placed into some sort of behavioral trigger that takes place immediately after that specific behavior. Or the reverse is true as well. If individuals do not behave or do not engage with specific content, you can also take action. So again, brainstorming, right? Um, individuals watch a video. They use a particular tool. They attend an event just like this. They download a something, and then emails happen immediately thereafter, right? What does this cause? to uh, occur. 
right? What's the, what's the end result? You have somebody's attention in so much as they're behaving in a particular way with a piece of content. You're following up with something extraordinarily specific and relevant based on this initial behavior. This is huge, completely invaluable in so much as right now they're on your site, they're taking a look at a something. The specificity in relevance and timing is optimal. So some examples, elementary examples at that. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for downloading, viewing, accessing, etc. And even further in this thank you, we are again urging, guiding users down a pathway. You took a look at this, taking a look at this, may be a great idea concept for you to access a uh, that, right? People that have taken a look at this have also found that to be of interest. You watched this particular video, maybe this would be of interest to you as well. Increasing the specificity and relevance in marketing. We have their attention. Let's continue guiding them down this particular pathway. So something as simple as a thank you email. What about a transactional upsell? You purchased of this, people that purchased of this, um, have also examined, explored, investigated that, right? Um, product A, people that have purchased product A, they find value in exploring, examining something along the lines of product B. Huge. And in the process, some sort of a transactional um, uh, upsell. Uh, our friends over at Pizza Hut, oh, <laughs> Jimmy John's, the sandwich shop huge on this, right? Uh, you know, I order sandwiches often from Jimmy John's and, and in my email inbox, you know, bit after lunch or something along those lines, after that sandwich is delivered, I get some sort of coupon from them uh, for a next purchase, right? Huge. What about the idea of re-engagement as well? Um, individuals behave, individuals engage with your content, but um, after a period of time, maybe we're not seeing any behavior uh, uh, or engagement from them. And so we want to kind of lightly tap them on the shoulder. A behavioral email, it's huge for something like this, right? In this particular example, uh, this particular yogurt shop, hey, you know what? We haven't seen you in quite some time, and we miss you. Come and take a look at this. Here's a particular coupon. Here's a motivator for you to come back into our shop. So interestingly enough, again, on this behavioral email, this re-engagement, in this particular instance, people haven't been <laughs> behaving and engaging, but we want to send out a trigger when nothing is taking place. So the reverse is also true. The behavior doesn't actually mean that they're doing something. It could also be that they're not doing anything. So huge and again, invaluable. Another obvious one, cart abandonment. People are filling up their carts with things and who knows what's happening in the buyer's universe in their life and their day-to-day -day, uh, walk <laughs> where they put a few items into a cart and um, maybe they got to hustle into a meeting and they erroneously close their browser or maybe on purpose they close their browser or I'll come back to this and purchase this later or something along the lines of uh, they're giving it some more thought so they end up abandoning their particular cart and what a great idea. This is a more obvious one to you experienced marketeers in the audience. Card abandonment and a little reminder, you know, hey, you put all of these things in a car, we're eager and anxious for you to purchase them. Here's a nice friendly email and a link back to this cart for you to finish your purchase, to re-engage with us, to be back online with us. It's huge, invaluable. 
further. Another obvious one. Following up after organizations download something. Um, most organizations uh, are obviously uh, doing something like this, at least after the first behavior of downloading an ebook. Oftentimes, follow up seems to drop off, again, depending on the organization. Follow up seems to drop off after that first email. There's not many second or third or fourth or anything else happening after that ebook. There's certainly a, hey, thank you very much for downloading this, and then that seems to drop off. All right, you say, Brandon, all of these are extraordinarily useful. Good. How do we know if people are behaving? How do we know if people are not behaving? Well, the first piece is we need the data. We need the behavioral profile. We need to have a place where we can access all of this behavior and engagement so that we can then decide to take action or not take action. <laughs> so the big stumbling blocks are the data. Are you using a particular tool where you can see the full behavioral profile of individuals in your database? Do you see when a person downloads a something, you probably get a notification? Does it tap your ESP on the shoulder and say, hey, they downloaded something, send them a thank you, and then also send them further follow-up? Do you have any trigger mechanisms for cart abandonment? Do you have any type of data related to either point of sale, this is a little more complex, but point of sale and a person not being in the shop for, I don't know, an extended period of time and are you able to send them a, you know, hey, we miss you type of a thing. Obviously, the keys to success in most of this, sincerity, some sort of genuineness behind this, obviously relevancy, timeliness of messaging, test, 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 all of this. Think about your own consumer pathway. When organizations are friendly, when they're genuine, when there's that level of sincerity, we're more moved towards engaging with those next communications. We're more, uh, uh, we're, we're more inclined to be back on the site. We're more inclined to click through on that next email. Behavioral emails. Next in line kind of broad stroke on something like this. Email drip campaigns, right? Uh, lead nurturing style sequences. And this is where, um, you know, there, there's a good chunk of organizations that are doing this. There's lots that aren't. Organizations are great with that first follow-up email, thank you for downloading a something, and then it stops. But there's no sequence that continues beyond that initial, hey, thank you very much, great, thank you for accessing, et cetera. Nothing that follows that. Enter your email drip campaigns, your lead nurturing sequences. By way of definition, an automated email workflow, focused, guided, all of the messages are intertwined, they're related. They're delivered over a specified period of time. If you think about onboarding a customer, um, many an organization have uh, a elongated brand new client style email drip campaign. Send new client a welcome email. Wait for a period of time. Send them email to talking about the next step in their customer pathway wait for a period of time, send email three, so on and so forth. And that is your very vanilla style email campaign. 
right? Um, individuals are receiving email in a already predetermined clip in time. Send email one, wait two weeks, send email two, wait two weeks, and on and on and on. Useful, very standard, vanilla-esque, but a drip campaign. Are you using these currently? Does your email service provider provide this type of information, or provide this type of tactic uh, inside, of, uh, inside of its application and platform? Question for you, Brandon. Answer, maybe. Question about anti-spamming laws in Canada and email marketing. Uh, what's your insight into to that? Do you are you up to date on yeah. this? A a absolutely. I mean, I could provide extended bullet points um, on this. Let, what we should do, Jesse, by way of answering that is I have a PDF because it is pretty involved with regard to um, permission, implied permission, et cetera, for um, our friends uh, to the north. So what we can promise this audience is a follow-up to this email will include a PDF on can spam in Canada. And yes, we as an email service provider by law have to abide by these. Hope that helps. So with these drip campaigns, why? Why do them? Why spend the time? Well, the initial investment of the um, hee hee ha blood, sweat, and tears is worth the long-term reward, right? Um, putting these drip campaigns together, putting lead nurturing sequences and uh, these style workflows together uh, ahead of time is going to save you an awful lot of time and you're going to reap the rewards not only in the short run, medium run and long run, right? Um, the initial investment is going to far, is going to be, uh, it's going to pale in comparison to what you're going to reap uh, towards the tail end of this. I think the second one is the glaring one. One email does not do the job that a series of emails can, right? Now we put our consumer hat back on, and we've got brands that uh, we're extraordinarily happy with, that we're lifelong uh, clients of, customers of, right? And they send us messages. Very few of us are interacting with every single one of those emails. And certainly, these brands probably <laughs> are not just sending us one message. Why? Because they know us as consumers. They probably have some sort of behavioral profile picture of our behavior and engagement with their content. Sending a one-off email over a long period, space, and time is not going to maintain our level of interest, re-engage us, keep us engaged, and keep us attentive. So one email doesn't do the job that a drip campaign or a lead nurturing sequence could accomplish. Number three, valuable as well, hyper-targeted to life cycles and purchasing cycles. Again, tied back to individuals' behavior and engagement with your content. If you're extraordinarily transactional, if people are buying things off of your site at particular clips in time, and you have this tied to specific drip campaigns or lead nurturing sequences, now your specificity and relevance is obviously through the roof. Important. Always some statistics and analytics. Brands that are killing it. Brands that nurture leads see a 45% higher return on investment than those that don't. They're willing to invest that hard work and effort up front to reap the rewards in the short, medium, long run. What about some strategies in formulating this? 
requires some thought. This is uh, the Sharpie pen with the cocktail napkin. <laughs> Maybe that's where it starts. But the foundation for your specific drip campaign. Who are we going to be dripping to? What do we want them to do and how are we going to track their success? Oftentimes clients of ours are over the top. Cartwheels. Yeah, we're ready. Drip campaigns lead nurturing sequences to our client base and the way we go. All right, fine. Well, that's a good start, but what do we want our customers to do? Why are we going to be dripping to them? What do we expect to see? So some sort of idea ahead of the curve that before we set up some sort of drip campaign or lead nurturing sequence, <laughs> an idea of who the persona is that we're dripping to, what do we want that result to be? Some sort of measure of success. I love this next one. Now we move from possible cocktail napkin to um, actually diagramming it out, whiteboarding it, right? Moving it towards some level of visualization. I don't get a set of steak knives uh, for every client that joins uh, my.lovelycharts.com. But this is one of the ones that, uh, in working with clients, just to quickly kind of whiteboard something out. The ability to put in, you know, shapes and arrows to diagram this so we could see kind of in the optics uh, uh, behind it all. Start making some sort of sense out of uh, what our drip campaign is going to look like. Where do we want to put the conditional intelligence? Right? To move from simply drip campaign over to some sort of lead nurturing sequence. Right? And understanding the difference between the two. A uh, complete drip campaign, send an email, wait, send an email, wait, where that lead nurturing sequence could be send an email, user opens and clicks on a specific link, send them down a different pathway. So we have now some conditional intelligence built in there. Our specificity and relevance is now uh, optimal. <laughs> We're serving up the right content at the right time, not based on what we want to throw up against the wall, but how our users are interacting and behaving with content. Huge. Where would we use these after an event? Jesse, over at Fay Business Systems Group, more than likely, well into the 90th percentile to be true, has a drip campaign post this webinar, right? Relevant content based on people that have registered and attended. Relevant content based on people who have registered but did not attend, as well as based on people who simply ignored that initial uh, email for registration, right? Hope you enjoyed the particular event that we had. We invite you to join us in a this, that, or the other. Huge. And then maybe even a follow-up to that. You joined us for a webinar with uh, regarding uh, email campaigns. Email campaigns could go hand in hand with our next event that has to do with uh, social media, etc. And further. And even one more. Now, let's even use this particular event um, and our five topics we could quickly and easily <laughs> construct an email drip campaign post-event, analyzing, dissecting, providing gems, getting significantly more granular in each of those topics, and now all of a sudden I got five emails post-event, huge, with further calls to action. 
may be talking about products and services that Jesse and I offer, quite possibly maybe. Consultation calls, friendly reminders on where to uh, access information. If you like this webinar, sign up for our next one. Those types of things. Further, we use this here at Acton, as mentioned. Welcome aboard. Some information to get you started. Before you meet with your customer success manager, take a look at this video, download these tips and tricks type of a thing. And then a follow-up to that could be a person accesses the tips and tricks and we see that behavior and engagement and we could follow up with, hey, maybe take a deeper dive into this. Urging them along this self-service pathway up until they end up meeting with their customer success manager. But again, triggering off of their behavior and engagement and excitement to get started on their own. Huge. And maybe even further, something right towards the end of a short subscription cycle, just in using this example. We notice that you're coming to the end of your trial account. We've noticed that it's time for you to renew, I don't know, something along those lines. Success is here. Test, test, test. How are individuals interacting, behaving, and engaging with this content? The first drip campaign, the first draft, the first running draft is not set in stone. Continue to tweak based on what you're seeing, behavior and engagement wise. Consider interaction uh, with other email and incorporate other channels. Social, invites to a, uh, subscribe to a blog and the like. Where are we seeing the errors? This is not a set it and forget it type of a thing. We don't want you as an organization to believe that a drip campaign or a lead nurturing sequence that once built is something you simply turn on and that is done now and well into the future. We've got that particular piece taken care of. We don't have to go back. We don't have to look at statistics and analytics. We don't have to make changes. This is not set it and forget it. Constantly tweak. Constantly analyze. Further, what about adding some cool stuff to this mix? Again, our consumer hat goes back on. Think about those email messages that you've interacted with in the past. Think about those messages that stand out in your inbox. Was it something about the, uh, the text in the subject line? I know we've seen in the last number of months uh, emojis, symbols in the subject line. Is that even worth exploring? Certainly a lot of uh, you know, bells and whistles included in, in, in emails. Number one standing out, um, the tech savvy users, most of us that are semi chained to a phone and computer all day in the B2B world, makes the tech savvy users in the crowd smile. Oh, this is cool, this is nifty. I subscribe to a lot of email. I see a lot of different things out there. Uh, I consider myself somewhat tech savvy. I like when there's really cool kind of the, the whizzy stuff. Certainly increases my engagement. What are some cool nifty things to try? I've suggested a few. Subtle movement style uh, animated uh, Animated GIFs inside of uh, messages, 
subtle movements of caricatures inside of an email. I even did a little animation here. That's kind of cool. Some sort of animation around a, uh, a particular feature of your product, right? Maybe the video plays right when the email opens. Further link to a video, something along those lines. The animation really catches my eye. That's kind of why I included that in here. Really like seeing things like this. You know, some level of animation inside of, uh, you know, real life, kind of a cinema, cinema graph style image. People moving and walking style. Imagery. Again, the animation catches the eye. Where can we get these done? Handful of free, and again, this is being recorded and the slide deck will be produced uh, the close of this, you don't have to feverishly take notes. Image flip, GIF maker, Photoshop, GIF boom, etc. Key for all of these. Key for all of these. But beware. Oftentimes there is some compatibility issues with some of the animation that we're producing. Outlook, hmm. These perform well in things like uh, Gmail, Yahoo interface, etc. Um, but Outlook, Windows Phone 7, there's a couple more, but these are the two where uh, animated GIFs seem to be uh, of issue, where only the first frame of the image is shown. So beware. Also, um, animation inside of these images, file size. Don't overdo it, right? As stoked as I am about some of the uh, the cool whizzy, you know, jazz it up style stuff, you know, this does not have to be an overdo it cup overfloweth, right? Onesie twosie here and there, effective. And also that first frame of that animated image, you know, that is the is going to be the static image for those non compatible email clients. So as the image does move in others, be aware that in those other interfaces, that first image is going to be the static image. So important. Further, we'll breeze through these because again, you know, uh, effective, but um, don't necessarily want to, uh, you know, dive too deep into this. Not necessarily sure of the, you know, the tech savviness uh, uh, of the group, but HTML5 video, Apple Mail, iPhone, iPad, huge, Outlook.com, compatibility issues. With this, hmm. Certainly, if you're going to put in some level of video in there, uh, make sure that we're going to have a something else that could render instead of this particular video. If you have any and all developer resources, make sure that somebody is assisting you with this. And I put in a couple of tutorials in here uh, free of charge, Email on Acid and Litmus. These guys are great for providing you this free level of instruction um, on HTML5 video. Further, love this, the interactive nature uh, of email, right? Um, think of <laughs> scratching uh, your local lottery card, you know, your state lottery card. Um, cheesy, effective, right? Um, an email comes and urges the individual to scratch this off. And if you think about the number of emails that are being viewed and interacted with on mobile, this is huge. So could you possibly put some sort of offer behind like a scratch it? This just puts a smile on my face. You know, it's kind of hokey, but uh, again, extraordinarily effective. We have a special offer for you. Scratch away. Seriously, the interaction and engagement of scratching also functions um, 
you know, similarly to a form, uh, um, uh, the clicking of a link, so you have and you're able to uh, see that behavior and engagement of that email. Effective. Kind of animated it here for you. Take a look. Oop. Oh. Um, <laughs> again, uh, we giggle, uh, you know, hokey, cheesy, etc. But statistics are showing improves email engagement by 10x. We are simpletons in a very good way. Smiles. Why? Probably because of these statistics or this information. The psychology behind the interaction. Excitement. Hmm. What would they send me? Maybe some success. See what I've see what's actually behind there. 10, 15, 20 percent off a free something or other. Am I missing out on some special? Curious. These are the type of things that are, uh, you know, again behind that particular uh, scratch it style interface. Pretty cool. Again, with the others recommended, don't be sending this in every single message uh, that you're constructing. This is a, a once in a while, right? And again, the right types of offers, seasonal uh, discounts, discounts, some sort of seasonal approach, loyalty programs, further education. And again, a plug and no steak knives for branded, scratchit.com. Further interaction. It's imperative inside of our email messaging that we are providing our customers, obviously, um, but maybe prospects that we've had engagement with, the opportunity to share this on social channels. So this is huge. So we have the idea inside of, or, or the tactic inside of a message. And again, no brainer, but mm, certainly uh, worth us discussing. Social shares, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, tweet this out. Where would we use this? Breaking news for your organization? Get local, right? Things like uh, uh, contributing to, the, to some local community effort, tips and opinions, promotion codes, oh my gosh, huge. Put that out on social channels. But like anything else, it only works if it's worth tweeting. Make sure that your <laughs> that your uh, social share buttons are actually uh, serving up content for those particular channels. I've seen a lot of clients make mistakes with doing things along the lines of putting out social shares and it goes nowhere. Now. Uh, now that prospects and clients alike are tweeting, are putting information out on social channels, are you following up on those social conversations? Are you retweeting or liking, um, you know, brands, organizations alike uh, will go back through and further engage with people that have engaged with their content. That's what it's all about. Huge. Click to tweet. Use it every day, if not every other day huge for you to be able to, uh, you know, again, create that clickable link where somebody engages with that link and immediately puts something out to Twitter. And you get statistics and analytics as to how people are engaging with that click to tweet link as well as the tweet itself. Huge. And that moves us to responsive design. Um, Almost by default, messages coming out of your email service provider, your bulk and broadcast messaging to suspects, prospects, clients alike, needs, emphasis, bold, italicized, needs to be responsive, given the percentage of email that's interacted with on mobile. It's huge that you're using some level of responsive design. No doubt. And again, the nods and the smiles and smirks in the audience tell me that you agree with this. 
Forty-three percent of emails open of email opens are mobile. <laughs> I think it's significantly more than that. Not that that statistic is outdated, uh, because it's not. But uh, I would say we're we're far surpassing the forty-three percent. Four hundred percent growth in three years again. That pie chart kind of sort of sums it up. Where are we seeing most of this? Mobile. Again, think about you yourself, um, your business email, your personal email, where are you accessing it the most? And no surprise. What about this? All right, think about your audience. Uh, an organization um, like uh, Map My Run, <laughs> You, you've got to believe 70% plus uh, of their client base is going to be accessing emails from those uh, from that organization via mobile, iPhone predominantly, smartphone device most certainly. Something like Litmus, though, and again, Litmus is that organization that provides um, an application for you to view how your emails are going to render on almost any and every email client. Yahoo, Gmail, AOL, Outlook, continue to fill in the blank. So litmus users, litmus prospects, litmus clients are more than likely individual uh, marketeers for the most part you know, doing some level of digital marketing. Now, if you think about you yourself as the digital marketeer and as a, quite possibly a client of Litmus, more than likely you're viewing these emails um, from your desktop, not from your mobile phone. And email, mm, not necessarily catching up, mm, although a little bit faster. <laughs> but 80% um, of subscribers delete emails that look bad on their phones. And I am inside that 80th percentile. There's no doubt. As I you know, have my smartphone set a particular way so I could see uh, you know, the who of the message, if it's looking kind of wonky, it's going to get deleted. How does responsive design factor into all of this? This cascading approach, right? It's going to render very well on desktop and inside of webmail style clients, but also depending on the size of the browser on the smartphone and that email client, if I think about my iPhone, it's going to cascade in so much as the text is going to be extraordinarily visible and the calls to action are going to scroll nicely so that as I'm viewing all of this information on smartphone, it all looks clean. Some information in here about cascading style sheets. Um, you know, uh, a, a quick blurb. Um, I'm going to make sure that in the follow-up email that we have a PDF on responsive design. Um, either your ESP has this feature and function. Most do. You know, by default, rendering the email in responsive, or um, you could put a bit of coding inside uh, the message for that message to render accordingly, based on that particular um, screen uh, length, width, et cetera. So I'll make sure that there's a, uh, that PDF in there as well. So this, uh, you know, we're talking about the technical aspect here with this media queries, right, where we're putting in some level of coding. And so then what does it do? Some level of coding could make the email look like this to the left on desktop and then cascade accordingly to the right on mobile device. But oftentimes, here's the rub, 
it's inconsistent. It might look one way on an iPhone, different on Gmail, even more different on Android. But here's an answer. What about a single column of content? Um, and again, most DSPs are able to offer up some level of responsive design either by default or some feature that you're able to turn on. Basically what they're doing is uh, rendering content in a particular, uh, in a single column. And how that looks kind of elongated. My consumer hat is on. If the email continues to scroll, scroll, scroll long before you get to kind of like the brass tacks, um, I've got the attention span of a gnat sometimes. And so, um, you know, I'm probably not going to get all the way down to the bottom of your message, and I probably won't see um, a call to action because most organizations are placing some sort of call to action down towards the bottom. But uh, for those organizations that are broadcasting email to me that uh, either know or assume that I have the attention span of a gnat, keep their emails short and sweet with a call to action right near the top. And of course, I like big buttons. And I cannot lie. And so as responsive email makes it into my inbox, wow, um, a large button to uh, take a peek to fill out a form, to fill out a, you know, to complete a survey or something. Keep in mind that if the call to action looks clean and slick, big buttons to engage with, uh, to behave with accordingly, and I get to a form that's itty bitty and I can't fill it out on my iPhone because it's like an eye chart, mm, probably not going to see me filling it out. So keep that in mind. Not that I'm a big, you know, survey completer on my iPhone, mm, depending. Note for file, I might want to move this particular slide a little more forward in this presentation um, because, again, this is me. Um, when I think about responsive email, um, my mobile strategy is more than just the design of the email in and of itself. How is it going to render in this inbox? Right? Where is my attention? You know, how am I going to get the attention of individuals that are engaging with this type of stuff? And so I'm taking into consideration the entire mobile inbox experience. That pre-header text, right? LinkedIn does a great job with this, providing me feedback on when somebody endorses me. And instead of this type of view this email in your browser, you know, I get a hey, there's some information immediate that I can see in my inbox experience. Huge. Really like emails that render it uh, for me uh, on iPhone that look accordingly. Big buttons that I can engage with. Download a free app. <laughs> if I'm engaging with this on iPhone, that's probably a uh, one of the top things that I would include if and as your organization offers an app. Where can I point you for assistance? Um, again, this is going to be published. Seven free templates are located at this link. And then an extraordinarily technical resource, responsiveemailresources.com. Huge here. Great information. And then again, thinking about where your client base is, thinking about where your prospects are located, right? Um, I happen to be a B of A customer. Again, no steak knives there. But I get email from them. And uh, whether they're noticing that I'm interacting on my iPhone, I have to believe that they are. I continue to get email messages that render extraordinarily nice on my, on my iPhone. And so the question is asked, do you know where you are meeting your suspects, prospects, 
where your customers are interacting with your messages, and then providing messages uh, tailored to those individuals. Phew. All right, covered a lot in that short clip in time. Um, Jesse, as we slowly but surely bring this uh, bus into the station, any other questions or comments from the group? Yeah, a couple questions here. Um, I've been waiting. I've been saving up this one. I think it's a really good one for the end. Uh, what do you recommend for ideal length for an email subject line? Hmm. Um, Geez, I mean, what's what's best practice? Um, you know, it 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 depends. What type of email are we sending out? Is it some sort of you know exclusive offer? Is it uh, you know are we hoping that somebody schedules a demonstration with us? Um, it, it, it it all depends. Uh, I can tell you personally, I continue to have success with long subject lines. <laughs> My marketing department. Um, would say, I'm going to give the textbook response to this question, right? Short and sweet. Short and sweet. That's not to say like two or three words, right? Maybe a short phrase. Uh, I think about all of the emails that we broadcast out to our customer uh, and prospect base. And it's typically a very short phrase, right? Mm, three to five words, that type of a thing. Um, hope that helps. Yeah, and when and when you when you talk about email volume, you know, what do you recommend or don't recommend sending within a certain time frame? Like, for example, three emails a week or one email every two weeks. You know, what what's your thought on that? Um, it depends on the sales cycle of a particular organization, right? Because I have these consultations with organizations that are highly transactional and short but sweet sales cycles. And so they're broadcasting well into the five, seven, sometimes 10 messages a day at varying times of day because, again, short and sweet, and it all depends on has the customer previously purchased, what's their purchasing habits, et cetera. Longer sales cycles, you know, uh, look, we're eventually going to get there uh, three, six, nine months down the road. I'm not going to hammer you every single day or three emails a week for a long sales cycle when I know we're in it for quite some time. Um, so again, depends on the sales cycle of an organization, highly transactional, I mean, feel free to rev it up, right? Um, I think about past purchases I've made at Amazon. I can go into my inbox right now and I probably have, you know, again, not necessarily related to past purchase confirmations, but hey, you looked at this. People that looked at this have also looked at that. Hey, you bought this a couple weeks ago. People that bought that are also buying this. So I'm getting <laughs> lots and lots of email love from Amazon. Well, heck, the juggernaut that is Amazon with a highly transactional environment, you know, point, click, buy type of a thing, I would expect to get a boatload of email from an organization like that. Hope that makes and sense. Then, yeah, absolutely. Um, one final thing on subject line uh, best practices. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned A/B testing a little bit earlier in the presentation, and yes, what's yeah. So A/B testing on subject lines definitely something we should be doing. Yes, no. Abs absolutely. Yes. You know, I. Best practice, if not you know, certainly required, as we're A-B testing email, right? And an A-B test is not limited to just an A and a B. It could be an A-B-C-D-E-F-G test in varying subject lines, right, to see which one performs the best by way of click-throughs and conversions. Huge. And that is a very quick and dirty way to find <laughs> Not necessarily dirty, but a quick way to find that most effective subject line, right? Be creative, brainstorm. Uh, you know, a, a, a couple of subject lines that, that drive the same point home. Send it out in a test to you know a subset of a particular audience and see which one performs the best, right? Let democracy choose the one. I don't know. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does definitely, and if. Uh, 
in the chat box there, guys, I sent, I put in a little link that we have to a short how-to video on um, A-B testing. So either you can Huge. take some time, take a look at that as well. Uh, but Brandon, that's the last question. That's all we got. Um, fantastic work. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, everybody look out for the recording. We'll send you all these PDFs that we were talking about that Brandon had yeah, mentioned. Yeah, I got two PDFs, PDFs on, in there and a couple of other links in there to include to uh, everybody yep. on the line. Thank you very much for your attendance today all. Jesse, always a pleasure presenting with you. Talk